one needs Jesus. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> That's not the word, but... <laughs> oh, I know everyone needs Jesus. Do we really believe that? Like, seriously. If, if there was one thing you could give to somebody, what would it honestly be? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. We think, oh, let's prepare for our children and let's save college money and let's do this and that. You know what? If you work so hard to prepare for your kid's college fund and you forget Jesus along the way, you're not really blessing them as much as you could. We need to remember Jesus all the way through in our families, in our marriages, in our friendships, in our children. Amen? So, I don't know how far we're going to get today. I was going to carry on from what we talked about two Sundays ago, and uh, who was here last Sunday? I'm just wrecked right now. You guys are looking fuzzy to me. Is that okay? Last Sunday was powerful. We had a lady, Catherine Nash, in. You know, the true prophetic, on average, is fairly intense and fairly strong and fairly bold. I've known a lot of good prophets, I know them to this day, and I'm quite shocked at the boldness they carry. Sometimes I look at them and I say, grace, please, grace, add some grace to it. But you know what? When God speaks, he speaks. Don't ever take a prophetic word out of context, okay? Very important. If you take part of what I preach here and you just take one little section out of context, you can make it sound like all sorts of things. It's how every false religion has started. They've taken parts of the scripture and manipulated it, rewrote it in different ways to make it sound truthful, but they've actually manipulated it. Why do I say every false religion's come out of scripture of some base? Because when Adam and Eve and God were in the garden, it was the truth and the foundations, okay? There was no other religion. Christianity was the first absolute true, and it wasn't a religion, it was a way of life. That was the reality of it. So every false religion out there, Hinduism, Islam, whatever it is, they've all come out of some sort of a structure foundation of the Word of God. They've all come out, then some man has had visions or dreams, rewritten his own book or manipulated it in any way, however it happens, but they've all come out of God. We must not take uh, parts of prophetic words or parts of Scripture to justify your opinion. You must take them in the entirety and the wholeness. You don't take the Word of God to justify why you can do sin or why you can say something improper. If you do that, you hold a grave responsibility. It's called accountability. And we have to be very, very careful of it. But in saying that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the vision of this ministry, first of all. And this is one of the reasons I, we're not on Ustream today. We are filming it. We're not going to produce it until uh, a little bit from now. Because something has happened in this ministry, which is amazing. Amazing things have happened. The vision of this ministry, I'm not even sure when it fully was birthed in us. I know that I was, I was baptized at, see, 1972. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, I was saved in 1972, I was baptized in 1974, and uh, then I fell, uh, you know, lived my own lifestyle when we moved back here in Canada, and uh, 1982, had a motorcycle accident, rededicated my life, and actually at that point, started seminary, started serving God in the church, um, started speaking at youth ministries or youth groups, and, and actually in my early teens, or middle teens, late teens, I mean, I was actually already sharing my testimony to different places, but in my heart, I always felt that we would be part of something that would reach the nations of the world. I remember lying on my mom's tummy sometimes, you know, you just lie on her lap, and, and I'm the youngest child. My oldest brother is uh, 17 years older than I am, so he's an old man. I'm younger. Just kidding. I'm a young man. Just kidding. Uh, he's, he has wisdom. Anyways, and then there's uh, four of us kids. I'm the youngest. My two oldest brothers are 17 and 15 years older than me. Then there's this big gap, and then my sister's three, old, three years older than I am. Okay, So we grew up together in South America, Peru, and Ecuador, and Mexico, uh, Florida, California, 
Canada, and now I'm ready to go back to Florida, actually. I really love the weather in the tropics, but here for here, we're in Canada. I'm not, I know, I'm not, I'm not. Um, anyways, vision started to happen in the 80s, uh, increased for me. Um, I remember when I was a little kid, in the, in the, probably in the 60s, late 60s, um, I'd lie on my mom's lap, you know, and she'd kind of run your fing- her finger through your hair. I don't know if you ever had that, but I did, and, and that's why I don't cut my hair, because I still feel her touching me. And I'm just kidding. Guys, please, please, please. Um, ay, ay, ay. I messed up. I got to tell you, if you don't know what that means, uh, don't worry. Um, and uh, I remember her saying, son, you're my youngest one. You're going to really do something for the Lord in your life. I don't know if she said that to every other kid. I don't know. But it hit me. It impacted me. I always had a vision in my heart that one day I might minister in front of people. And a lot of the people around me when I was a little kid, oh, come on, you're all haughty. You're puffed up. Haughty spirit, don't, what do you mean? You're only grade three, grade four, and you're talking about preaching in front of people. It's okay, you know, it's okay, young boy. But you know what? Something has to shift and change. Something that God gives to us internally starts to do something from our conception, I believe. This baby that's in Leona's womb, this baby that's in Donna's womb, if anyone else is pregnant, surprise. No, I don't know, but... um, (laughs) Something's already happened there. God has already, as soon as that conception happened, God has taken that conception process. He's created, he created the miracle in the first place. Some people say it's not a miracle. I believe it is, okay? When you can create something from those, an egg and a a sperm, and that's a miracle, okay? Any way I look at it, okay? People say, well, it's a natural concept of life. Yeah, but God created it as a miracle, okay? So anyways, something happened. And immediately, in the mother's womb, Jeremiah 1.5 says, I formed you, and I knew you, and I sanctified you. So right now, looking at, at your, in your baby in that womb right now, God has already formed. He has already sanctified it. He sanctified this child. He sanctified it. What does sanctification mean? Fulfill, to, to, to build a purpose in you for a purpose to serve him. It's an aspect that is already a purpose that is delivered. Sanctified means I've given you all ability to accomplish the task I have put in him. Sanctified. If you're sanctified, you're sanctified in Christ. It means that Christ has given you all the ability to do everything he has called and spoken into your destiny, into your future, into what you're called to do. You're sanctified. It means he's given you the ability to do it. So those kids are already known by God. They're already being prepared. They're already, I bet, given vision from him. His vision, God's vision, God's will be done in them, in us. So here I am, this, this 80s into the 90s, we were helping with Abbots for Christian Assembly. Sharon and I were part of the leadership team there for 17 years. We're not church hoppers, we're just, we were there for 17 years. I came back from a Baptist background, Sharon came from a Lutheran background, but we knew that we would go to a different church. And it happens to be that ACA, uh, Roy Rubelak, when I was visiting there, when my mom and dad were still alive, I had been spirit-filled in North Carolina, came back to Canada, went and visited. Uh, it was my, actually, my mom said, let's go to ACA and visit. And Roy Rubelak came out, picked me out of the crowd, and prophesied a word over me about my destiny. So we go back there once we're married. That was years before I, I was married to Sharon. We go back there because of a prophetic word that was spoken to them, spoken to me. We minister there 17 years. We start a ministry called Windward Ministries. We had the grace and the approval from our leadership at Windward. We were part of that, I'm sorry, at ACA, we were part of that leadership. I love it when when you start things with the grace of the leaders. I don't like it as much when you start things out of hurt and pain or dislike of the leaders and you leave the leadership and you take half the church and you start them. I'm not as big on that. It doesn't seem quite as right to me. If you have a disagreement and you've come to the agreement that it needs to separate and split, at least go with the favor and the grace of the leadership. It really heaps blessings upon you in a big way. So our leaders, we had talked about it for a while, and the reason we first started Windward was um, people were wanting to support us as missionaries that were outside of Abster Christian Assembly. 
And so they wanted to give straight to that, to the ministry. And so we did, and our leadership all agreed to it, accepted it, and thus Windward Ministries got incorporated in 2003, okay? It was a ministry, probably from 1996, it started to really facilitate itself when Sharon and I went into full-time missions, okay? Why am I saying I'm giving you a history of this ministry? From that you know, we ended up being a part of uh, working with Bethel in Mexico, working with tons of these different ministries. We felt to be a support base for some of the ministries that needed help on the ground. So we were sort of like this liaison that would build things and get things going in the churches. Plus, we evangelized. Could you even number the amount of times we've done evangelistic outreaches? I mean, for the eight years we were in Mexico, I was probably, my kids and myself and Sharon were probably out evangelizing five to seven nights a week, okay? So I had a passion in my heart that what, whoever came to Christ, we give them a Bible. That was just my passion. Didn't happen all the time down in big evangelistic outreaches. So we spent thousands, actually spent everything we had on buying Bibles, because we gave out so many Bibles and New Testaments, but we had such a peace in our heart that you've just given your life to Christ, here's a Bible, okay? Here's the four spiritual laws to help you walk through it, you know? So that's just what our passion has been, okay? Um, we've had prophetic words left and right come to us about um, uh, sending, raising up people and sending them out, the nations, churches, uh, schools, you know, all this stuff. We've had tons of really great prophetic words that have come to Sharon and I and to our ministry, and uh, it's been exciting to watch. And uh, just about three years ago, so this is 12, so 2009, uh, actually the end of 08, uh, we were in prayer. Uh, the church we were involved with at that time was struggling. Some big things had happened um, in it. So we talked with the leadership. They gave us grace to actually start a Friday night evening service and mission. So we rented the basement of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church, and, uh, which is a church Sharon grew up in. And we rent their basement, and we're doing a Holy Ghost meeting. Um, actually, it was probably just a bunch of healing meetings of broken hearts, I felt, you know. And uh, we did it Friday nights uh, there so we wouldn't interfere with any other churches. We wanted to honor and respect the churches, okay? We did that for uh, just about a year. We started that in uh, our first service was May of 2009. But the church we were with gave us such grace, they actually put $500 a month for the first three months into our rent, yeah, a lot of people don't know that. I just want you to know. We did it with grace, with favor, with blessing, okay? So we're over there, and we knew in our heart things were changing. We had a passion for this valley, and, uh, and so uh, we started in the first service in May of 2009. Then we waited two weeks and actually started full-time the first week of June of 2009. And then... In March of uh, 2010, we felt in our hearts, you know, since we did a, a bit of a poll with a lot of our people that were coming, and majority of them lived, you know, on this side, the south side of the Fraser River. And so we thought, well, hold it. Maybe we should make that more easy, like easier. We're looking to build a base. Why? Because when I had talked to my board of directors about what the vision the Lord had given to me to establish a gathering place. That was actually the original name. Um, it was Windward, but it would be a gathering place. I saw multiple churches and ministries gathering together and raising up people and sending them out. And it would become a center where we could have supernatural schools. We could have, and it wasn't just any one supernatural school. Patricia King would come in. Bethel would come in. We'd get all this influence plus our own DNA pouring in, raising up people and sending them out. And so um, I made a pledge to the, uh, actually a fleece to the Lord and said, well, goodness, if I'm the one one going to call to be pastor in this thing or raising it up, then I said to our board, I said, if it doesn't grow beyond 50 people, okay, in the first year, I'm not the man to do it. Okay, let's just face it. I'm not, I won't be the man to do it. Doesn't mean I'm less or more. Any, just, I'm not the man, but someone will come along who will. Anyways, it never got that low. It just was bigger and it just stayed big, you know. Anyways, uh, so we went to the theaters, Remember the theaters? Anyone was with us in the theaters? We did five Sundays in the town cinema, okay? We were the movie, you know? People paid to come watch us. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. 
That'd be a great reality show, wouldn't it? I was talking about that, uh, one of the young visitors here today, she actually is in programming for uh, computer games. I said, wow, you should make a new program, um, shoot the pastor program. No, I'm just kidding, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, yeah. But it might sell big, eh? You know, <laughs> ah, ah. No, I'm joking. Anyways, um, very much knowing my gift mix probably wouldn't be seen um, as a typical pastor type man. Is that safe to say? Do I look like the typical type pastor? Okay, good. Yes, okay. <laughs> so knowing very well that if we start this gathering, we bring this, this together, um, sooner or later someone's going to rise up in it. Anyway, so we were five, five weeks, five Sundays in the theaters when this place opened up. We came here, uh, was uh, the beginning, first week of May, and uh, 2010, we had to sign a two-year lease. He wanted three years, I felt in my heart two years was the max we could sign, um, because I felt it would actually become too small. It wasn't going to be the right place, it was going to be a stepping stone for the next place, okay? And uh, so we signed a two-year lease, and we've had a blast. I mean, we've had great, we've had some, some hurts. But boy, have we ever had some great times, you know, and growth. I, I'm probably working with one of the strongest leadership teams I've ever worked with in my life, okay, in this place, and have one of the biggest leadership teams that I've ever worked with that are actually in leadership, you know, compared to in our other church was 800 people. So, I mean, you know, it's like, it's amazing what God has actually placed in here. We also declared and said, I felt in my heart, that we weren't to go out and evangelize and bring in fresh people or new people until we had a family established here. Because I, I, all our evangelistic years, I, I saw so many people would go out and evangelize, bring people into the church, but the churches were never growing, if not shrinking. And I'm thinking, well, what's going on with that, you know? So why don't we build the family first? Live evangelistic lives, absolutely, but let's build the family. Let's build it strong. What was the word the Lord had laid into my heart then? Build a foundation strong enough for the children yet unborn. So to me, that means new believers, and it means a generations of children yet unborn, okay? So I would rather build with the Gideonite army than with the 32,000 Israelites that didn't make the cut, now, most churches will go after the 32,000 because they want to go for size. My heart is to actually go after the army that drinks his wine well, that drinks his word properly. I would rather stay with that army than go after the big, big army that might not move forward. Not saying that the big churches aren't a call. They are. I believe one day we'll be that too. I really do. Or someone's going to raise up and do it. So I have no doubt in my mind. The prophetic wars that have come here, I have no doubt in my mind. So in saying that, that's been a progression that we've come to. Um, the landlord uh, asked if we wanted to renew our lease, you know, um, last fall. Because, you know, he wants to get six, eight months, you know, kind of preparation, like six months prep. Something in my spirit was saying, boy, I'm just not sure, you know, and I'm kind of been... You know, and so I've been procrastinating about it, praying about it, talking to our board. He wants us to sign for three years, minimum two. They love us here. They've had no complaints here. Can you imagine? We've got businesses on either side of our walls. Actually, three of our walls have businesses on them. But there's limits here, too. One is parking. One is the size. When you get a church to about 75% of the seating capacity, you actually need to start another, start another service or something. That's kind of... People just don't like coming in, five of them, and having to split up or shuffle or whatever. But anyways, so I've been saying, should we release or shouldn't we? I mean, two more years? It's already hard when we do a conference or we have a special speaker in the parking and, and the one bathroom upstairs. You know, we got the urinal working, but it took a while. But it's in the same room as the toilet, so still one bathroom unless you're a married couple. <laughs> and we do have one downstairs sometimes I'm waiting before I come up here to minister I'm ooh, person's in there for a long time I'll run downstairs oh another one's in there for a long time hmm should come upstairs and preach sometime anyways we obviously are limited so in our prayers trying to say Lord what is wisdom? Do we renew the lease or don't we? What should we do? What should we do? 
We're going through a, such a, 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 people are going through a season of testing. Anyone felt testing over this last year, six months, eight months? There's a season of testing. And what I found in 20 some odd years of ministry, what I found is when the greatest tests come at you by the enemy, the greatest victories are waiting to be released. Okay? So the worse you feel from these testings that are going on actually speaks in my heavenly understanding that great victory is on its way. But you see, if you're not doing anything, the enemy's not going to come at you because he's happy with you. But when you start doing something, as a church, it comes from all sides. It comes from people you wouldn't expect it to come from sometimes. You know, lies start being spoken. Things start being shared. I mean, literally. Why? Because the enemy does not want the progression of this ministry to the next step. They don't want it. He does not want that. But I rebuke that devil in the name of Jesus. I say, we are a mighty army. We are warriors for Christ. And we win the war. We have battles along the way. But guess what? We win. Why? Because we stand on the truth of God. That's the reality of it. So, here we are in Windward Ministries in the warehouse. Wonderful warehouse. We've got it set up very nice. We've got fans. We've got LED lighting. Uh, we've got a beautiful stage. We've got sound systems. We've got people. We've got Sunday school. We've got youth. We've got women's ministry. We've got men's ministry. We've got men's breakfasts. Uh, we've got uh, six churches in Mexico we oversee. We've got another church we're wanting us to oversee in North Vancouver. We've got a lot of things happening internationally. I've got trips that are coming up. I leave, Mike and I leave in March to go to Mexico to speak into the churches. Uh, just, there's so much happening. Amazing things are happening. We've got no carpet so we can spill coffee and not worry about it. We don't have pews so we can move the seats. I mean, we're all doing good. But our lease is running out. So we have to make a decision. So it's interesting. There was another pastor that approached me in November. We know where to grow. It's been prophesied. It's been spoken about. Bill Johnson spoke it. Patricia King spoke it multiple times to us. Uh, James Maloney speaks it to us. Wesley and Stacey Campbell speak it to us. Uh, 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 Catherine Nash spoke it to us, who we just met half an hour before you met her last Sunday, okay? But now there's this connection going on. It's like, what's going on? We hear all these words. We hear all these things. We know. We know there's a destiny. We know there's a destiny in this place. And you know what? Sometimes it takes a weeding out of people to get the people that are ready to actually so envision with what God's called us to do that we actually can go in 300 or 50 or 100 or 200 and actually defeat 130,000. I mean, seriously. There's passion in my heart. Uh, that passion took me away from six-digit figures in business to take my wife and my kids into the mission field not knowing where our next meals would come from. That passion drives me. Why? Because it's the truth. It's the Word of God. He has told us that we are building something for the generations yet unborn, and I will not give up on that, and you must not give up on it. Because that's, that's what the Bible tells us we're supposed to do. We're supposed to raise up sons and daughters, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, it's a generation of revival. If we have revival right now, I almost don't even like that word because revival's not even in the Bible. There is no revival in the kingdom. The kingdom is what you and I call revival. We just need to spread the kingdom. We need to spread it. We need to live in it. We need to grasp it. So as I'm praying, I'm feeling in my spirit, talking with our board, I just don't know if I feel like renewing the lease or what. I actually feel it limits us. We've had multiple people that have come to us uh, that have come in and said, you know, we'd, we just love the church, but you just don't have enough space or you don't have this or, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, oh you know, oh. But we can. But we got to do with what God has given us right now. Sharon and I, we went on a 40-foot sailboat to start our ministries. I had slept in the back of my pickup trucks with no tent, no mattress, no nothing, night after night after night in the middle of the, the Baja Desert because I wanted to minister to villages, little, little, little villages and tribes that didn't have electricity, that didn't even have running water. Well, one had running water. It had a hole in a rock, and the water rolled out of it, came out of it. That was it. 
who wasn't from a pipe. We built a church there. This place is called Los Burros, the lost donkey. I drove my 4x4 four four in, 160 kilometers, 10 to 12 hours it would take me to get my 4x4 four four in, crawling up and down boulders and rocks. I mean, the, evangel- the translator that went with me the first time says, you either are hearing the voice of God to minister to these people, or you're absolutely nuts. I said, I'll take both. 200 people in the village. I got to baptize and lead to the Lord, 75% of them. We built a church. To this day, it's still there, still standing. I haven't been back. We haven't been back. We took teams from Canada in to build it. We took generators and plywood, and the kids were so fascinated at how fast we could actually cut through a piece of plywood because we had a generator and a power saw. People, there was so much more, so much more. I felt in my heart when I had the vision of putting the gathering together it was a, actually another individual that's no longer in the church that felt it should be called church and, and pushed church and actually registered a website as church. And, and I kind of felt like, no, let's just keep it a gathering. Well, what's church? It's supposed to be church. You know, church is a gathering. And so then it called Windward Church. And one day I came, I went, oh, I'm shocked. Why, why is it called Windward Church? Well, it's the way it's supposed to be. And I, I don't care if it's called church. I don't care if it's called Smoky Dopey in the Moon. I really don't care what it's called. But I know one thing. If God's in it, I want to be there. So last November, a pastor that I've been ministering with back and forth, relationship with for a couple years, he came to me. Now, I had had a vision for him, a word of God for him a year and a half before, but I didn't say anything of who it was, but I saw another person coming alongside and actually leading something that was going to release him. I'm a firm believer in the principles of the Jethro, when Jethro went to Moses, and Moses uh, uh, gave in the principle that some will be leaders of 50s, 100s, and 1,000s. I'm a firm believer that if you're a leader of 50, don't expect to be a 1,000, because you'll destroy yourself, you'll destroy your family trying to build the kingdom that you think you need to be at. Why don't you start at 50, and when when you're worthy with that talent, you'll multiply it to 100. When you're worthy with that talent, multiply it to 1,000. However it works. Now, you could start at 1,000 people or more, fine, wonderful. But let's not go for the big gusto to justify ourselves. Let's go with God and let him justify us. So anyways, this pastor approaches me. We have coffee together in November. And um, he talks and shares a bit about his church and congregation and the great things that are happening, but it's shrinking. So he, uh, he asked and said... Um, would you consider joining with us? I went, no. (laughs) What do you mean joining? I need to understand that. I said, yes, I'd consider, but what do you mean? Like us come under you? That doesn't make sense to me. We're a church growing, you're a church shrinking. So what do you mean? And so over the months we dialogued and we discussed, we talked with the board, of Windward, and uh, just to let you know, it's progressed farther. They have a building, they have land, they're debt free. And this Sunday, right now, they're asking, probably sooner than I have gotten to this point, they're asking their congregation and speaking the same thing that I'm speaking. He's a pastor for 28 years, great man of God. Great congregation, great church, same DNA as us. And they want to give us their land and building. So we, yeah. Now, if you've ever been in church long, that's actually abnormal. It does happen sometimes, but it's abnormal. I'm sure out of the 100 plus churches in the city, not many have been given the building and land. Some have, but not many. But it's not a matter of us taking it over, it's a matter of a marriage. He's a pastor. He's a pastor that I'm not. And I'm an international person that he's not. Their passion is the presence of God. 
So get a video clip ready here. We're going to show it in just a moment. You'll understand right away, and I'll talk some more about it. We'll shut the lights down and watch the video. 'Cause you just don't care. You're feeling so platonic. Now you're getting supersonic. Do you wanna get supersonic? You got to get supersonic. Get 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 supersonic. Super supersonic. Do you wanna get supersonic? You got to get supersonic. Get 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 supersonic. Supersonic. Now you got that feeling, and it makes you want to fly. Not play it safe because you never know when you die. Just lift 'em up, cause you can't get enough. Enough. Your life is so simple. Do you wanna get supersonic? You got to get supersonic. Get 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 supersonic. Super supersonic. Do you wanna get supersonic? You got to get supersonic. This is Crouton. I'm just making sure that you keep it C R U N K in the U S A. <laughs> If you know what I mean. What a call! I know you like to party. I know you like to dance. When you get in supersonic, baby, then you know you're gonna get the chance. <laughs> When you get in supersonic, baby, then you know you're gonna keep it crumb. Yeah, come on. I know you like to party. I know you like to dance. Oh my goodness. Supersonic. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, my goodness. 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 Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, my goodness. Goodness. Do you wanna get supersonic? You got to get supersonic. Get, get, get supersonic. Thank you to Samantha for putting that together. I was a videographer, but that doesn't matter. It would be the biggest step of this ministry, financially, pastorally. But it's a big, big decision. I prayed about: Are we to step out of Abbotsford? And I felt in my heart, since we've been two years, just about two years in Abbotsford. Oh, and when they would like this all to be accomplished would be in April. Our lease ends the 30th of April. It's going to be windward. Windward's a governing body. They're coming under us, with us, merging together. It's part of breaking ground, and it's the favor of the Lord pouring out. I've talked to a couple people 
James Maloney's one of them. He prophesied this to me, Sharon. He actually told Paul Taylor, Pastor Paul, he said, because Paul approached him and said, what do you think? And James Maloney said, if it was anyone other than Brent and Sharon, I'd say no. But because it's what God's doing in them and their ministry, you'd be a fool not to. That's humbling people. That doesn't puff Sharon and I up, it lowers us. We've been in a building less than two years and we're being offered a couple million dollars of revival center. It's humbling people. It makes me cry, I've cried much over this. So I asked, Lord, why, why would we step out of Abbasurd? And I feel like the Lord has said it's for a season, but I've measured it. We're about one kilometer from the line of Abbotsford. But it's actually dead center of the valley, and it reaches to Aldergrove, Langley, Surrey, Richmond, Delta. We have people that come every Sunday and part of this ministry. It's going to shorten their distance. And I believe it's going to open a lot more doors up as well, too. It seats 350 people. We're going to pull the pews. I told them already. They said, absolutely. They're looking forward to getting the pews out of there. We're going to put chairs in, okay? So <laughs> it can sit 300 people downstairs for overflows. But the interesting thing, when Paul asked me in November, I said, whoa, just a minute, I'm in a vision. When he just asked me if I'd be interested in, join in coming together, I said, hold it. And I went in this vision in the cap coffee shop. And I said, I see land. I didn't know there lay a land. I thought they would have owned. I've only been in their building twice before this. And it was always at night. I thought that they owned the parking lot and the building. That was it. I never expected them to own the field. Anyways, I'm in this vision. And I said, can you please give me a pen and some paper? So he grabbed a, a napkin and he pulled a pen out. And I drew. I said, I'm seeing land. If this doesn't make sense to you, it means what will be purchased in the future. And I'm seeing land, and I drew the land over a little jog up, over to 264th, up, back, and across. And I said, this little area on the right, I actually thought it was the church manse, you know. Um, I said, if for some reason it's dark, and so is this big piece over here, but I said, in the future, this will also be be the, be the churches, and so will the next piece of land too. But I said, the field confused me because I see it clear as day, and on, in the field, I see this big, beautiful, uh, rectangular, commercially-looking building, and the city of Aldergrove will actually give us the okay to bring our driveway entrance in off of 264th, and then I saw a lit sign, like a Jimmy Patterson-type sign, with all our services flashing around, and then some kingdom businesses also rotating in there back and forth, and it was a gathering place, and I said, the old building will be used as a youth center, weddings and funerals and whatnot, but it's really going to be a fired-up youth center. I said, I hope you own the land. If you don't, we, you're going to buy it or we're going to own it or something together. And he, he started to cry. He looked at me. He says, we own that land. We own that field. He says, the piece that you saw blacked out isn't it some little golf center. They shoot the golf balls across the field to 100 yards. They got it all marked out. But, and the piece over here, they said, we have prayed and prophesied that we're going to own that and own this golf center in the future. So our two boards met, uh, Kevin Bessinger, it was his last board meeting with us, it was the Tuesday before he passed away. And I talked with Kevin after that board meeting on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday about it. His excitement was so high. His excitement, he says, this is God. I get to be a part of it, this is God. Don't miss it. So I've measured the distances from, if you're coming down the freeway, from Clearbrook Road, exit, it's seven minutes. One was seven, one was eight. Take off the two and a half minutes to get from Clearbrook Road to here. If you're coming down the freeway from eastern Abbotsford or Chilliwack, you're actually adding five minutes. That's it. From other people, like, you know, some that live in Aldergrove, like the Jacksons. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so, big, big decisions, big prayer time. 
I have no doubt in my mind. And what it is, is it's two churches marrying, marrying together, okay? We gain leadership and pastors. We gain all their intercession and prayer, joins and link, meet, links with ours. We gain their worship teams, mixing with our worship teams. We're married together. I said, well, in the marriage, is it two men coming together? And he said, no, it's a man and a woman. I said, who's the man and who's the woman? And Paul said, they're the woman and we're the man. Because it's an authoritative structure. To me, it's very important. People say, well, what do you, what's so worried about authority? It's very important because the authority that you're under the covering that you are with will really dictate and justify a lot of your future. People that followed Gideon, the 300, actually won the war for the 32,000. So I look at it and I say, Windward, it's not a done deal yet. We're praying. But I wanted to share it to you as a family. Next Sunday, all of County Line is going to be here with us. The Sunday after that, all of Windward will be with County Line, and we're doing a potluck in the kitchen and basement downstairs as a family. And the, and the Sunday after that will be the decision. God, you're big. <laughs> Beyond our understanding. Due to your response during the DVD, you sound excited about it. I, didn't want, I don't want to lose anyone. But I know we might. We might lose some walk-in people, stuff like that. But I believe we're going to gain so much more. So the Lord laid in my heart. It's a season but I've known in our ministry, Sharon and I, in our lives, you must walk well in the season. If you don't walk well in the season, you sit and wait for the next, chances are the next won't come and you're going to miss it. But you must walk through the season to get to the next season. Right now, we're in winter, the ends of winter, almost into spring. Did the groundhog get a shadow? I honestly don't know. I'm not superstitious. Let's say we're in winter. If we stay in winter, we'll always be cold and we don't allow spring to come, the flowers will never bloom. If you stay in depression, hurt, frustrations, emotional distractions, you'll never see blooming flowers bloom around you. I'm ready to move into spring again and watch flowers bloom. And let's plant some flowers on our property. Let's paint, let's clean it up, let's change it. They just haven't had the, the ability financially to do it. There's no debt. We're not stepping into a debt load, people. It doesn't happen in a two-year-old church very often. But it happens in the kingdom of God all the time. All the time. Our vision that I shared, that I've, we built this ministry on, is empowering and equipping people into their God-given destiny using the truth, the word of God, honor amongst ourselves and integrity in our lives. I know the prophetic words that have been given to us. I know we will see a youth center rise and fly. I know we will see a school with students hungry rise up and we're going to see signs and wonders all over the place. I know that. We will reach the nations of the world. I know that. We will have missions teams going out. I know that. We will stand on the word of God. We will preach truth. I know that. And I will not let that change. I believe we're getting a center. We're getting an area to build the base. This is leased ground. This will be owned ground. In County Line's history, was formed in the 40s, Mennonite background. And something happened in the 70s, and the Holy Spirit showed up. And so they were asked to separate from the traditional, because the Holy Spirit was showing up. So they formed County Line, the society. And out of that church, things have happened. The first vineyard ever in Canada was formed 
I'm sorry, it was out of a church split, but it shouldn't have happened, and they know that. And it formed Langley Vineyard. And then they were looking at becoming Langley Vineyard, and they felt, ah, oh, Vineyard wanted them to shut it all down and Vineyard to take it. And, but this time, the leaders know that it's right. That this time, they know it's time to hand it to the next generation church kingdom that's rising up. We're going to gain some incredible people. There's great men and women of God that are there, have great vision. When I shared our vision in the board of directors meeting two Tuesday nights ago. Yeah, two Tuesday nights ago. The board lit up. And they said, you just shared our vision. You just shared our vision. We just need the one to lead it and carry it. And if Paul and I co-lead, he's going to pastor. Woo! Now that's my yell. Woo! Yeah. Not that I don't like pastoring. I love pastoring, but I pastor leaders and pastors. He's going to pastor. I'm still going to pastor you guys, but he's going to have time to pastor you guys. He's got a pastor. He's got 28 years, I think, of pastoring experience. It's like, dude, you beat me. I honor you. I respect you. And he said the Lord told him to lay it all down and submit under what we're called to do. And he will go higher than he ever would by himself. That's humbling for a man in his 50s pastoring for 30 years or 28 years. It humbles me. I look at our our are wise people in this place. I look at them and I say, see, you guys humble me. Yeah, but you pastor us. They call me their pastor. I'm like, yeah, but you father us. This is a generational church, and it has to be. Can you imagine when we fill that seat, 350, we fill it, we go to two services, then we build another big building? How much vision do you have? I got a lot. Some of our board were in there already telling me exactly what they want to do immediately. Paint this, change that, clean that, do this, do that, scrub the toilets because it's a little stained. I said, let's put new ones in. It's new toilets. I am so fed up with one toilet. Let's go new toilets, okay? Let's change the color in the woman's bathroom. The dark green isn't doing it for me, but let's do something, okay? We have full freedom. We'll have full freedom. Hmm? You want to paint the outside, Andrew? He's a painter. You see what I mean? It's like, guys. I want to buy one to two vans, 15 passenger vans, so we can bring our Chilliwack guys in. Huh? Actually, that's not their bus. No, yeah. So anyways, that's my preach for today. So next Sunday, have some of our people park in the Cal Tire parking lot, please. Because we're going to have another 30, 40, 50 people coming in. Yeah. Make an effort to get to know them because they're going to be family. They're family already, but now we're marrying. Okay? Yeah. Literally. This place, most things I hear when people come in is the church is full of love. Windward is full of love. It's like a big family. So one thing that I've talked to leadership, they said we must not lose the family atmosphere. We're not. We're just going to add to it. Okay? They have family too. We have a great atmosphere. They're going to mold these together. We're going to get Paul preaching, me preaching, Kevin preaching, others preaching. That's what it's going to be, okay? But I have no doubt in my mind. I'm off to Mexico. You know, in May, I'm asked to go to Kitimat. I'm sorry, in March, I'm asked to go to Kitimat already. In May, I'm asked to go to Alberta in April. I'm asked to go back to Kitimat in August. We're asked to go into Mexico in August on a missions trip. Uh, all of us or some of us are. I mean, it's, it's going to happen. That's the reality of it. But that's what we're called to have a destiny of. Fulfilling each other's giftings, we all go higher. 
When worship played today, it's fulfilling the giftings. We all go higher. Some will come, some will go. But when you stay focused, the favor of the Lord will come upon you in such a way, it'll make you hunger for more of him. This is favor, people. So we need to pray. It's still one more decision to be made, ultimately. And that's going to come the first week of March, okay? So we're going to pray and see where it all goes, okay? And if you're discouraged in any way, don't be. Earnestly pray, okay? Because we're here about God's will be done. Not here about my will or your will, but actually God's will be done. We don't come to church for what church can do for us. We come to church for what we can do for him. That's kingdom, people. And as we do more for him, us is looked after. Us is looked after. Let's all stand. So, Father, we thank you for opportunities, windows of opportunity. I believe, Lord God, that this is a window of opportunity. Father, if it moves forward and and completes itself like many of our prophetic apostolic covering has said that it should, then we pray, Father, your will be done in it, Lord God. I pray for County Line, for Paul, his leadership team, the elders, uh, the board of directors. I pray for the congregation, Lord. Let them not feel that this is a ministry taking over. Let them feel that it is a merging and a marriage together, coming together, brothers and sisters in Christ, coming together as one unit. (laughs) Unity. I actually have a feeling, and I told uh, my board and elders this and Paul's, that this is the start of one church gathering with us. More will come. More will come. More will come. So I thank you, Father, ah, for the great things you're doing. I thank you, Lord God, for the ministry that's there, the wells that have been dug, revival wells that have been dug, signs and wonders that have happened in that place. I thank you, Lord God, that we get to come and help line those walls and strengthen them in those wells. As well, Father, we get to dig new wells as well and mix the water together of your glory and of your kingdom. Purify it, Father, I ask. Purify it. Purify their hearts, their motives behind it, our hearts and motives behind it. I ask, Lord God, open up the congregation's hearts of County Line and Windward to see that, Lord, this is you. It can only be you because we could have never thought this one through. (laughs) I would have never thought this one through. Thank you, Father, in your precious and holy name. Let your will be done. Amen.